Hello everyone, as promised, I want to show you some Sergei Karyaki miniatures. And uh, we're starting way back in 2002 with a game that he played with the white pieces against a player named Rainier Road. Uh, just some quick information about Karyakin. He became an international master in 2002. 12 years old and the Grand Master in 2003 and just before his uh, 13th birthday so we're getting ready for the match with Carlson in November and I want to compare and contrast their uh, their games so here's a few miniatures from Sergei Karyakin starting from early in his career so we open up the game with e4, g6, modern defense, d4, bishop g7, knight f3, d6, c4. Now the game uh, tends to take on a uh, king's Indian type flavor. And uh, you should know that many moves can be played, knight c3 can be played here uh, bishop e2 bishop e3 is a lot of flexibility in these systems so c4 was played bishop g4 and uh, black's main idea is to attack the d-pawn and uh, what this bishop does is aid in that attack by pinning this knight to the queen so the idea if uh, black could move again would be to take this bishop let's just make a dead move here a3 and for instance a move like bishop takes f3 queen takes f3 would drop the pawn to bishop takes d4 so white would be forced to compromise his pawn structure uh, somewhat which actually in this position is not too bad this is very solid and he has the two bishops but that is uh, white's excuse me black's idea is to pressure the deep on okay so bishop e2 breaking the pin c6 again black is staying real flexible uh, usually this move is designed to allow the queen to come out to a5 b6 or c7 later on down the road sometimes um, this pawn can be used to help with the b5 advance and sometimes this is done in conjunction with a6 and then b5 attacking the uh, c pawn also uh, when queen c7 is done sometimes we see e5 being supported also Karyakin just castles natural move bishop takes f3 this is the real uh, first suspicious move in the game uh, beside just the opening general from black but um, if you notice this capture was just totally unprovoked so we're just waste, wasting uh, some time. The bishop takes f3, so unprovoked capture gives up the bishop pair for uh, no compensation at all. So that was definitely an error. Queen b6. So this is black's idea. Black gave up the bishop because he feels that he can win a pawn right out of the opening because as you see this pawn in d4 is attacked two times and the only piece that can really defend it is this bishop but then the problem is is now the b2 pawn is defended excuse me uh would be attacked and exposed after bishop e3 so that was um black's idea in taking on f3 unprovoked 
but as we'll see that idea is very uh, superficial uh, it's it doesn't have a lot of depth to it and the reason is is because if we look at the development situation here white is castled has his bishop developed and he has a fantastic center and basically all black has developed is his bishop on g7 and he's out uh, pawn hunting with this queen which is a recipe for disaster in the opening let's see how Kariak can handle this so he protects the most important pawn there's two pawns so the one that's most important is this one in the center on d4 so he protects that and develops a piece and he calls black's bluff so black takes the pawn but now let's look at the development let's count right, we got one two three right we'll count the castle kings being developed right and we just have one over on this side and if you want you can count this queen I don't really count it but we'll count it here and we can see that the leading development the combination with this uh, beautiful center that uh, it's very hard for black to take down because he hasn't attacked it uh, adequately enough uh, gives white a nice advantage if not a winning game knight d2 so white has all of this development for the price of the b2 pawn another queen move look at that so now let's count up the course all right all of this development and beautiful center for the cost of one pawn rightfully Kariakin goes on the attack so queen b3 attacking this pawn b6 and notice black is is not developing he's basically trying to take that pawn and just keep it Kariakin goes to open the position because that's really the only way he can exploit this lead in development and the development is uh, a time a time here because if he just sits back and does nothing then black will eventually catch up in development so with the situation as it is white wants to crash open the gates and attack so d takes c5 d takes c5 b5 so there's black trying to keep the position locked down as much as possible rook fd1 knight d7 bishop e2 and we can see uh, Kariakin uh, kind of is, is kind of has kind of lost his way a little bit here knight gf6 because now black seems kind of safe f4 castle and now black is completely caught up in development he basically just has to get this rook in the game so let's go back a few moves when white's advantage was really big here so c5 d takes c5 d takes c5 b5 okay now we just mentioned that we would like to keep this position open so perhaps a4 would be be a better be a better try here It's interesting and let's see instead of c5 because hmm, it seems like black is able to shut the position down somewhat after c5 but c5 seems necessary c5 d takes c5 d takes c5 
Yeah, I think A4 is probably probably the correct move here. All right, so Rook FD1, Knight D7, Bishop E2 was played, Knight GF6, because here I think Black is Black is all right. Because he's able to catch up, he's able to get himself together. <clears throat> yeah, black is completely fine at this point. Um, and white still has some attacking ideas, but he doesn't have that overwhelming lead and development that he had earlier. And black has now um, <clears throat> staked his claim in the center. <clears throat> Excuse me. But white does have ideas of G4, G5, and still trying to attack on the queen side. And there it is, g4, bishop f8, double attacking this pawn right here, on c5, rook bc1, so now we see Karyakin having to play a little, you know, a little defensively now. So that, that's one of the signs, you know, that something has gone wrong in the position, because he had this huge lead in development. And now all of a sudden black is caught up and uh, he's had to take time to slow down his aggressive maneuvers. So A5, G5, <clears throat> knight takes knight to H5, wow. Black has gotten pretty bold. That's like an automatic move right there, G takes H5. Now that these two pieces lined up here, this knight has to be careful. Now, instead of moving this queen again to attack this pawn, why not get this piece, excuse me, get this piece over to the, um, the D line right here. So he's going after this pawn. Okay, I can leaves this pawn in order to attack this one and queen takes h5 let's play it. b4 king h1 preparing the assault over here and this game is is uh it's kind of sad in a way because black actually fought his fought back pretty good but then it seemed like Black became overconfident. For instance, he thinks he's just going to push these pawns home without defending the uh, king side. Seemed like Black got overconfident and then blew the game. And then this move right here, the b7, is just um, special. Because, it's, <laughs> I mean, Black thinks nothing is, is happening <laughs> on, the queen, on the king side. So he just plays this this move right here. Rook g1. Bishop g7. It, this f6 is brutal. And now we know that black is definitely lost here. g6. Just crashing in. And white was victorious. Black had to resign right there. Right there on the spot. So, for instance, after knight takes f6, it's just simply g takes f7 check. There's a double check from the um, rook and the pawn. King f8. Queen h6. King e7. Bishop g5, and then there's going to be some trouble. For this knight right here, either rook, let's say for instance queen d7, either rook can just come to this file, just adding on to the pain and misery of the position. So black resign there. All right, this next one uh, was between Sergei Karyakin and a player named Metsalu. Tonu Mitsalu. 
and this I believe was in uh, 2002 also alright let's get it so e4 from um, Kariakin c5 knight f3 knight c6 we have a Sicilian on our hands we don't know which kind of Sicilian yet but from here you usually get some kind of accelerated dragon or you get uh, Shreshnikov you know those kind of Sicilians okay we don't get any of that <laughs> from here we can get into a rouser variation there we go Bishop G5 very aggressive continuation E6 Queen D2 <clears throat> excuse me you've seen this plan before white is just gonna castle queen side and go for broke on the king side just throwing everything everything at the uh, black king this should be seven castle okay of course typical Sicilian white is gonna black is gonna use this open C file and then try to throw these pawns down at the uh, on the white king and meanwhile try to pick up that pawn in the process and also if he can try to get d5 in which is a good move okay so castle there we go f4 many times white wants to play e5 or f5 f5 idea is to undermine this square right here So we could put a piece in there. And e5, of course, would drive the knight away, which is the defender of the king side. Okay, so bishop d7. Okay, that leaves this pawn inadequately defended. So, Kariakin attacks this pawn. Now e5 is played. Now you get to see how d5 is weaker as a result of that move. Okay, I can just took the pawn. Knight takes d6. E takes f4. Bishop takes f4. Bishop G4 and we could just take a quick look and we can see that the opening of the position is not to um, black's advantage it's to white's advantage white is is better developed as pieces lined up on the center and is uh, is well placed and he has a pawn remaining in the center so this benefits this benefits white Queen b6 was played. And now e5. And the idea is uh, drive this knight away. And leave this guy vulnerable. So he captures. Queen takes e2. And now we see the knight driven back to a, a horrible square. And now his d5 that I was telling you about earlier, ready for occupation. We see the double attack here. Queen a5. <clears throat> this is kind of like a shallow attack on the, this pawn. Okay, I can just defuse that real quick. Bishop takes d6. And this knight is a monster right here, so he captures. E takes d6. Now we got a powerful pass pawn. Rook d8. Queen g4. And now the idea is basically if this knight comes and captures this pawn at this square will be unguarded so he plays f5 so for instance knight takes d6 now knight f6 check 
king h8 and then boom materials lost so Metzalo plays f5 queen g3 and now but white protects the pawn queen c5 develops a last piece An attack on this pawn right here, and and an attack on the knight. So, black is trying to be re resourceful, and he attacks this pawn too a third time. So black is being very resourceful, but the problem is there's no resources in the position. At the ninety-seven check, king h eight. Queen D3. <clears throat> now, the simple, simple move like C3 would have been real strong here. But Kyriakin plays C th uh, Queen D3. Knight B5. Queen H3. Now I want you to look at this pattern. Notice the knight has these two squares guarded. So just keep that in mind. Rook F7, Rook D3, Black thing figures it's time to capture that pawn, but Kariakin has a surprise here, and he just takes on H7 with check, and Black resigns. The reason why Black resigned is because these two squares are guarded by this knight and so therefore after queen takes h7 check king takes h7 this rook swings over and that was the purpose of rook d3 swings over delivering checkmate on the h file all right the next game features a player with the black pieces named martins alutis this game was played by Kariakin in 2001 and just to give you an idea where um, Kariakin was at the time um, in January 2000 he was already 2200 and by January 2002 he was 2460 and by April of 2003 the year he became GM he was 2556 so this guy was something else all right so he opened up again with e4 a ludus played e5 knight of three i love classical chess just real simple attacking the pawn protecting the pawn with development and d4 so the scotch game And black is pretty much forced to take that. I'm not going to get into the theory. But um, he doesn't have time to, to strong point the uh, E5 square as he does in the Rui Lopez. So he takes D4. Knight takes D4. Knight of 6. Knight takes C6. B takes C6. E5. And this is all theory. Knight d5. Now that's an inferior line. We need to know that queen e7 pinning the pawn and e5 is the proper proper uh, line to play. Knight d5 is inferior. c4. Knight b6. Bishop d3. Bishop b4 check, bishop d2, bishop takes d2, knight takes d2, and we can see uh, the difference with the queen not being on e7 and, and uh, white's queen not being on e2, is that black, is white just simply gets a nice free position, he gets all the space 
advantage control of the center uh, without uh, without any uh, concession at all and that's why that line with the early knight d5 is inferior you have to you have to play queen e7 and pressure that pawn first so this is a bad position for black castle castles and the game plan if you're wondering what the plan is in the position should be crystal clear is that the king side attack usually when the pawn is on e5 that's like your signal that you should be attacking over on the uh, king side most of the time you have this light square bishop that belongs here this knight belongs here on f3 on e4 and g5 the queen belongs on h5 and the rooks belong in e1 and d1 and if you could throw that pawn on b3 that would be my plan just off the top of my head and attack or in some cases play f4 and then the rook up look at all those arrows <laughs> all right so rook b8 so we can see that uh black is having a hard time getting his pieces up queen c2 so there's a threat h6 so it provokes some weakness on the king side rook f e1 queen e7 f4 f4 wasn't absolutely necessary but f4 rook d8 knight e4 bishop a6 and you see that black's pieces on the queen side have no prospects after b3 these guys are unemployed these guys are all unemployed this guy is almost unemployed he's kind of hanging in there by a thread hoping for d6 and D5 and opening up, but these these three queen side pieces are definitely out of the mix. Queen B4. Really no explanation for that move. It's just like the queen just jumping in for no reason. Rook E3. D5. So finally some type of. Uh, Relief. And right there, uh, Black resigned after this move. Now, you could stop the video and try to figure it out. But basically, the idea is after E takes D6, right on Passant. C takes D6, A3, Queen A5, with G3, with this idea right here, and let's say, um, let's just bring the queen. let's let's move the king, say King H8. It's queen b2. And after rook g8, queen d4, black's position just fall, crumbles apart. There's no way to hold everything. For, for instance, uh, after knight c8, then they get hurtful moves like that, knight f6. And of course he can't take because of the queen. So for instance he goes for the trade. Queen takes, knight takes, knight g8. So basically that's why black gave it up. It's, it might seem premature but it's really not. After, I mean his position is really, really uh, twisted up there. 
All right, our last game was uh, between Sergey Karayakin and a player named Rauk, R-A-U-K. And this was in early 2002. And Karayakin was only rated, and I say only, but um, he was only a master at this time. He was about 20, a little over 22, 2300, between 22 and 2300. And this uh, player Rauk was 2205. Another Sicilian. Okay. So instead of going into that rouser with Bishop G5 and stuff, you get Bishop C4. So it's like a Solzin attack. Queen E2. Again, same kind of ideas. Castle and Queen side and going for broke. Being real aggressive on the king side. Of course, you can still castle the other way. Knight takes d4. Bishop takes d4. B5. So black is playing real aggressive. Counter attacking. And, um. Alrighty. Okay. It's interrupted for a second there. All right, so where was our back? Okay, Bishop B3 was played, right? Yep, Bishop B3 and Bishop B7. So for our new players, that's the idea right there. It's putting pressure on that pawn. Push this pawn down to B4, attacking this knight. Drive the knight away and pick up the pawn. And that's how Black wants the story to go. But the Sicilian is very complicated, and it always doesn't doesn't always work like that. Um, and one thing I want to say too is notice that White has this development lead. But one thing you notice in the Sicilian is that since the Sicilian is what is called a semi-closed position, and meaning it possesses the po qualities of a closed position and some qualities of an open position. Is that often black can get away with being behind in development because the closed nature of the position keeps white from exploiting that lead in development. So this is why black is only is able to uh, live with just having two pieces developed while white gets a big lead in development. Just there's only the open C file. And there's no open diagonals or anything that uh, white can really use to to jump on black for instance in a lot of the king pawn openings where this pawn would be on e5 you can see for instance let me just make some no moves there you can see like for instance how strong this bishop is now just by having just by having the pawn on e5 but Go back to the uh, main line with the pawn here. And e6 helps to blunt the action of this bishop. And that's why when you see uh, the Sicilian, Sicilian defense played at grandmaster level, you hardly ever see the bishop brought to c4. Sometimes sometimes you do because like, there's certain attacks. For instance, Solzhen, um, you see it in the uh, accelerated dragon. But uh, it's not brought there as frequently as, say, like um, in the E-pawn openings, like the Joko Piano and such, in the Pyrrhic, where white has that clean shot at F7. Because most of the lines in the Sicilian, black just simply blunts the action of this bishop. Okay, so castles. B4. Notice how Kariak and let's lets black carry out his plan check in between move because now okay carry I can saying okay you want this e pawn but you're gonna have to give up the right to castle to get it of course he doesn't do that so now this knight has to come back Now we can see the value of the position of the queen being on e2. Takes 
takes with his bishop. Now, he might as well have took it, taken with the pawn. And try to try to uh, survive. But instead, he takes with the bishop. He takes d5. And he's probably hoping to play a move like that and keep the position closed. Look at that. I guess perfectly. <laughs> so, now, this is dubious just on the surface of the fact that this uh, is not a real threat because the pawn is pinned. Secondly, this knight is pinned. So, I was just talking about one minute ago about the closed nature of the position and why blacks able to get away with being behind in development. So now that these things have occurred, white has an opportunity to crack the position open. So my first instinct without even thinking about it is bishop takes e5. I'm not sure what Karyakin did. Um, but I'm sure there's several moves that would come to somebody's mind here. Rook e1, f4, for instance. So bishop takes e5, d takes e5. Remember this guy still pinned. Queen takes e5. And seeing now the development advantage. Excuse me. Now the development advantage can show. Now that the position is wide open. So of course he wants to trade queens. And he says, of course he doesn't want to do it. Uh, Karyakin doesn't want to trade queens. Black player does. And he's just jammed up now. Rook to uh, E1 is threatened. <clears throat> check a meaningless check at four and queen d8 rook e1 check bishop e7 so it looks like he'll be able to trade queens and get out get out of this situation d6 exploiting the pin and now the problem is, if queen takes c7, then white even has a choice of pawn takes c7 because this knight is on prees also. So queen takes c7, d takes c7. So now this guy is pinned, and this guy will be won instead. So he just castles. Bishop takes d7. And he just goes into a lost game right here. And he's just down the exchange. And he resigned. Alright, that is it for now. And we will see you on the next video. Please subscribe and like. And I'll catch you.